I'm Barry Benneke, live in St. Germain, Wisconsin, and I'm a wood carver. My specialty is carving birds of prey. The reason that raptors are uh, my favorite subject for birds, uh, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, they're really elusive. You don't see, you know, to, to see a hawk in the field or alongside a road or a, uh, you know, a, an eagle or an osprey or, you know, or, or an owl is even more rare because you very seldom see an owl. You know, they're hard to find, uh, mostly night creatures by, you know, the way they hunt. And I think my fascination with them was just the, the, uh, the way they, uh, they live their lives, the secretness of them, you know, that I could bring some of that into somebody's home. So I guess it's the elusiveness and the secretness of the birds that I'm fascinated by. The hard part is catching the tool just enough, just deep enough to get the stroke into there without getting too much. And I used to try to do it one quick push, but sometimes you have to kind of slide the tool back and forth to let the grain find itself. Uh, unlike a lot of kids nowadays who kind of have a vision of where they want to go and what they want to do, I really didn't. I really didn't know exactly where I wanted to go in life. And art was just a hobby at that time. And there was really a kid in the neighborhood who was, who was going to the Art Institute of Chicago and they had some openings in their summer classes. And he says, you ought to go down and apply. He said, I think you could get in. He says, you're good enough to make it there. And I did. I went down, I applied at the Art Institute, and I went there for a couple of years, um, and I was really enjoying myself. But unfortunately, I still had to make an, a living. I had a mother, I was living at home, and my mother said, you're not going to just sit around here, you got to actually make some money. So I wound up getting a job, a drafting job, of all things, and I was doing very well at it. I was a mechanical draftsman for a company called Automatic Electric, which was part of General Telephone Electronics. And I was a union guy back then, actually, a union card holder, you know, working on very schematics and all kinds of things for the, uh, the phone business at that time. Did I see myself uh, becoming something more than just an illustrator? At that time, I was fascinated by illustration, and that was really my goal, is to be probably the best illustrator designer I could be, and uh, that's where my love was. Uh, it's funny how an industry can take you from what you think you're going to be doing to what you actually become. Really, my career took off when I really uh, left the, the Chicagoland area and moved up to Minneapolis. At that time, I was fairly seasoned. I had worked with a lot of different clients. I worked, I stepped into a big catalog operation up in Minneapolis. Uh, that, that career moved me into a, a larger design firm where I was, again, into the management side, but I had the opportunity to work with many of the largest national Fortune 500 companies. Wound up with another catalog company after I thought I was ready to retire even early back then. That career jumped me into a, a career where I was working at a company called the Sportsman's Guide where not only was I able to uh, pursue, again, my 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 career in advertising and commercial art and catalog, but it also was a company that sent me on all these unbelievable hunts and fishing trips and got me back into something that I, I forgot that I had this passion for. Um, it was probably the best job a person could ever have in his life. If you were a person that loved the outdoors, it was the job. But things were calling me from Minnesota, calling me back to this property in Wisconsin where I live today. And it really had a lot to do with my parents and their condition in life and where they were at. So that was the driving force that made me say, now's the time if you're ever going to do anything to help your parents, now's the time to do it. My goal on carving is to try to get like six square inches of uh, detail done on a bird like this at a time before my hands <laughs> probably give out. Because that's a lot of carving to get that much uh, it looks, it looks fairly easy, but it's actually quite, uh, quite intense. The, the part where I jumped into uh, carving as a, as a hobby or a business is really kind of a funny story. We were really in a little shop over in Manaqua, and they had a lot of stuff on the walls, and I love to go in little art galleries and stuff and look around, and they had some fish up on the wall. I remember looking up at these rough-cut fish carved out of wood, 
And I said, God, I could do that, you know, and they were priced fairly well. And I asked the woman about them. She says, oh, yeah, this retired lawyer, he does these. And as soon as they come in the shop, they, they sell right away. They're really hot. So one day when I was back in my, my workshop, I was looking around. There was some wood laying around, and I picked it up and said, I think there's a fish there. You know, I said, I could do that. So I started carving some fish. That was my first experience into carving this. Now, I had experimented with some wood carving before some years back, but I really didn't have what I call carving tools, X-Acto knife and, you know, some crude tools, and you really can't carve much with those kind of tools. And so I, I did several fish, and the fish were starting to look pretty much like a, a real fish, but I never anticipated trying to do taxidermy type of carving. So the fish were going along okay, but again, I didn't see it as something I was passionate about. It just wasn't doing much for me. Fish, as you carve them, they kind of have this uh, no personality look to them. Even when they're done, you look at it, and it's, it's just a carved fish. So again, I, I was stumbling around with a bunch of wood I've got on my land here, and there was a stump sitting there one day I'd cut up, and I looked at it, and I said, God, I bet I could get a bird out of there. And I was thinking, what kind of bird could you get out of something like that? And it struck me, an owl's a perfect bird. It's kind of round, it's fluffy. You know, it has a personality. And I took a chainsaw and I started chopping it up and eventually I got to what I thought looked some, something like an owl. And again, I was working with very primitive tools. I knew nothing about carving tools. I had never had a wood carving catalog in my hand ever. And my son stopped by one day and he's also a woodworker, works up in this area, has his own little business and does some beautiful furniture. He says, Dad, that's pretty good. He says, you're doing that with those kind of tools? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I've got some back at the shop that I bought. And he says, you ought to try them. And he brought over a few carving tools the next day. And I says, wow, this is really easy now with these tools. Wow, this is great. So really with my son's encouragement, my wife's encouragement, and even myself looking at from going from one piece to another piece, I started seeing the evolution of my work. It went from something that, it, the first one I said, God, that looks pretty nice. It looks sort of like a bird. It's got eyes, it's got feet, sort of proportion, right? And the next one I did, and I looked at that first one, I said, boy, that's not too good, but this one's really pretty nice. Sometimes I think if I'm biting my lip, I must be doing a harder part of the grain or something that's it's fighting me a little bit. See again that that part of the bird is starting to uh, have some nice shape to the feathers. If I look back at my background when I was uh, working with perspective and doing a lot of mechanical exploded views or perspective drawings um, or any type of illustration where you're doing something that's a real life situation, whether it's a scene or a building, or because I've done a lot of that as well. When I look at a piece of wood, I can look into that piece of raw log or that block of wood, and I can see within that wood the structure of what I want to get out of it. I see the bird in there. I don't just take a piece of wood and say, I'm going to start carving, and maybe I'm going to find some kind of bird in there. I go usually at a piece of wood with a very specific bird in mind that I'm trying to achieve. Now, it doesn't always work. There are some pieces that hit the, the burn pile that never quite get there because the bird just doesn't show up the way you want it to. But I can usually tell within a fairly short amount of time of working with a piece of wood whether I'm going to get to something that's going to be where I want it to be or not. And so, yes, my background uh, really has helped, you know, the two-dimensional background. In fact, even when I look back at the technical drawings I used to do with the rapidiograph and that, that little fine mechanical line that I would kind of, you know, make uh, shadowing with or to build a, a kind of a dark area on a, on a prototype drawing of a, of a part. That is the same technique I'm using now. When I carve my feathers, a lot of guys, they'll use burning tools to create that softness and the, and the detail, the veining of the feathers. I could do that. I, could, I choose not to because I choose to use small V tools and, and because I want my carvings to be different than other people's carvings. I do it because I enjoy that little detail work that 
really goes back to my basic start in, in, in the, the field. I mean, it's, my whole life has been like that. So I, I think that the reason my pieces look as good as they do today is because really the background that I had, really they both fit and they, they marry together. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about when you work on the carvings, and this is something I found again through the, the number of pieces I've done over the last several years, is if I can get the eyes to set right into the bird, that's when I know I've got the bird nailed. So uh, you'll, when you look in my shops, a lot of times you'll see a piece and you'll see the eyes are set into it and the rest of the bird is very, very rough. It's, it looks like it hasn't hardly gone anywhere. And the reason I do that is not because I just, I'm fascinated with eyes. I just know that now when I work with the eye part of it, if I can get the head shaped and I can get the beak right and I can get the facial disc on an owl right and I can get those eyes set in there, and if those eyes look right and those, that the rest of the head feels like it's going to work, that's where I start. And then from there, the rest of the bird just starts coming together. I was very disappointed in the past when I started doing some carvings. and I did almost the whole bird. And then I went to set the eyes in and the eyes didn't look right. And basically, there's no way to capture or rebuild that thing. Once the eyes are plunked in that bird the way I set them in, I can't pry them back out with a screwdriver. They're in there. They're done. So now you've got a carving that looks pretty good, but it doesn't look great. You know, or it looks okay, but it doesn't look terrific. So the eyes tell me everything. This happens to be a barred owl, common to our area. Probably our most common owl for the Northwoods. The one that we hear the most often when we're hearing owls in the woods. When I bevel, these are the facial discs. Thing. You take out a whole curl of wood. I call these Paul Newman eyes. The freedom now of working in a wood shop or having windows or going and doing some of my work outside is really, I go back to, again, a career that kept me in an office an awful lot of times. I was inside a building, sometimes very nice offices, beautiful office, but no windows, in, you know, with a desk and drawing table. I wanted, if I was going to carry on with some type of creative work in my life in the latter years of my retirement, I wanted something that was going to allow me to work outside, to have some freedom, and so that's what I do uh, to this day. So that's, that's the freedom I enjoy with my wood carving. And I think my carvings now, I mean, I don't, I'm not the world's greatest carver. There's, there's really, really top-notch, wonderful carvers. But for the kind of carving that I do and for my hobby and what I'm doing right now, every carving is an improvement upon the last, and that's what I want to keep going for. <laughs>